Welcome to the Top Business Leaders Podcast. You'll learn how successful people just like you have grown their businesses, expanded their influence, and made money by writing a book. On each episode, you'll learn the inside secrets to help you create a book that can serve as a powerful marketing tool to skyrocket your business. I'm your host, Dan Janelle. I help thought leaders, business executives, and entrepreneurs write their books. To find out more and to download our show notes, go to topbusinessleaders.com. I'm delighted to welcome our guest today, Stephanie Chandler, the president and head of the Nonfiction Authors Association. Welcome. Hey, Dan, thanks so much for the invitation. Oh, I'm so delighted you could be here today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and maybe segue into what the association does? Oh, my goodness. Well, I am a Silicon Valley refugee. I left my soul sucking career back in 2003. I opened a 2,800 square foot bookstore in Sacramento where I live and thought I was going to write novels in the back office and turned out I was a terrible novelist uh, and owning a retail store was a great training ground for learning all things business and marketing and meanwhile my Silicon Valley friends were trekking up to Sacramento to see what I had done. They couldn't believe that I had left a six-figure job to sell $4 paperbacks <laughs> and I was really inspired by them and it actually led to writing my first book which was a business startup guide and it launched a whole new career I hadn't expected. I started getting invitations to speak and consult and and that ultimately morphed into starting a publishing business meanwhile by the way i was writing books for traditional presses and and i was publishing other people's books i sold the bookstore and i got turned off by traditional publishing so i brought my own books back in house under our authority publishing brand and i was out speaking at writers conferences and noticing that nonfiction writers were you know really greatly ignored at those events that all the fiction writers were getting all the the love and attention there so uh, back in 2010 i launched a nonfiction writers conference completely online i had no idea if anyone would come to it dan pointer was our opening mm -hmm. keynote speaker i loved him and miss him greatly and people came and they loved it so each year we had this online conference and and people would say afterward, how do we keep in touch when it's over? There really was no community for nonfiction authors. So that led to the launch of the Nonfiction Authors Association in 2013. And, you know, that association has grown beyond any of my wildest dreams. We've got over 14,000 in our tribe. We've got local chapters happening across the U.S. We've got a chapter in the U.K., we do weekly educational events and we send out um, all kinds of educational content. I'm really proud of the amount of education that we provide and we've got a really active private Facebook community. So it has been a wild ride I did not expect to take, but I am so grateful because I love what I do every day. Fantastic. I know you've also written a new book. You've written several books. Tell us about your new book and how that book is helping your business. Yeah, the latest book is called The Nonfiction Book Publishing Plan, The Professional Guide to Profitable Self-Publishing. And it's all about publishing nonfiction and how you can use it to build your own business. So I teach authors how to, you know, launch their speaking and build consulting and online product sales around their books. And I do all of the same things. I walk my own talks. So my book in particular brings me, um, first of all, exposure for our nonfiction authors association and our conferences. Uh, so it brings us new members and new, you know, community members. But it is also brings me publishing clients. I really don't advertise a lot that, that we still publish exclusively nonfiction. We're a hybrid publisher. But that book, even though it walks you through step by step how to publish your own book, uh, a lot of people read it and say, that's too much work. I just want to hire this out. And so it's actually been a really interesting uh, referral generator for us. Fantastic. What advice would you have? Well, you, you, I'm sure in your, all of your education, 
uh, classes and seminars and conferences, you must hear certain questions over and over and over again. Why don't you share with us, say, the top three? I'll prompt you just one at a time. Uh, what are the top three <laughs> questions you get about self-publishing or writing your own book from a business perspective, from a non, non, non-fiction Oh my gosh. Um, well, I think everyone wants to write a book and, and for some of us, it's easier than others. Uh, I would say common questions are, how do I do it myself? And uh, the, I guess a big warning there would be, beware of doing it all yourself. I, I really am a big believer that you have to hire professionals. You need professional editing you need professional cover design. You need professional typesetting. We just had this debate in our private community this week about, you know, well, I've, I've got an outline on how to do my own typesetting. I think I'm going to give it a try. And several of us jumped in and said, you know, you may not want to do that because what happens is it ends up looking self-published. And in order to overcome that stigma of self-publishing, you really want high-quality production so that it looks like it was produced by a big New York publishing house, right? So, um, so those are probably the the top question is how do I do it? And my advice is go get some help with it. Uh, next up is how do I outsource my marketing? You know, nobody <laughs> wants to do their own marketing, and I get it. And you know, my line there is even New York Times bestselling authors have day jobs, right? We all have day jobs. We all have family commitments. We are all spread thin. I'm a single mom. Like, it is stacked up. Uh, But we have to make the time. And so I I have this gardening analogy that if you walk out in your garden every day and you plant three seeds, over time, you're going to have a beautiful garden. And I think book marketing is very similar. If you just set out to plant three seeds every day, you, you know, write a blog post or you pitch yourself for a podcast or or uh, you reach out and and pitch a trade publication, a guest article, over time that adds up and it doesn't take a ton of your personal time. So I really encourage authors to invest in their own marketing. I don't know of anyone who has ever completely outsourced their marketing and had it uh, return on their investment because it's really hard to earn back that investment, right? So I think that's one of the the biggest issues I see. That's great advice. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I always tell my clients that it takes a village to produce a book. And I think you gave all the reasons why. So thank you. Yeah. Now, when you wrote your book, how did you decide what to focus on and how deep to go? Because a lot of my clients are wondering, do I write the entire encyclopedia about my topic or do I write a big business card that just lets people get to know me, like me, and trust me? What are your feelings about that? Oh, I love that question. Um, so I'm a big fan of the old storyboard method where you take a stack of a business or of cards or of three by five cards or a stack of sticky notes and you write every topic that you want to cover in your book and stick it up on a wall or spread it out in front of you. And then you start putting those in order of what becomes your logical chapters and you turn that into your outline. And it's funny because just a, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke with an author who had that issue where she'd written, I think she was up to like 140,000 words in her manuscript. And I said, you know, that is like two and a half really large books. What if you broke that down into a series? And when we dug into her outline, she had basically five main sections. And guess what? She's turning that into a series of five books, shorter books. And I love that concept. So if you do find that you have an encyclopedia of knowledge, can you carve out uh, certain niche topics to create your books? And I'll tell you, Dan, we can learn this from the fiction world. Series books sell. And there's not as many in the nonfiction world. So that's another way for you to stand out, especially if you've got really distinct topics that all tie together. So making that decision might be that instead of overwhelming yourself, you narrow that content down to your first book and try to keep it under 60,000 words, or you think big and you expand that into a series. Great. 
you know, um, let's not get too deep into the self-publishing versus traditional publishing, because uh, I know we could talk about that for hours. Right. And I think we both come down on the side of self-publishing. But I'm curious, uh, one of my clients came to me, or a prospect came to me, and he said he wanted to write a certain book. And it was really a great book idea. And he had the credentials to do it. And he said, I want to hire you to, to write this book for me. And I said, better we should write a proposal first and see if we can get an agent to sell it to a publisher. Because if we write the book, we're going to have to write a proposal anyway, and then find an agent who would be interested. So why don't we just put the cart before the horse and write the proposal first? Would you say that that's a good idea now? Or you know, should you write a proposal or should you write the book if you want to be traditionally published? Well, in, is it a nonfiction? Yeah, nonfiction. Nonfiction, I'm assuming? Yeah. So, yeah, the great thing, I guess a great thing about traditional publishing is they don't necessarily want to see the full manuscript immediately. Mm -hmm. They want some sample chapters. So I think you're right on the money there. Put the proposal together, um, get your outline and, and two or three sample chapters, and that will carry you for most traditional publishers. And in the meantime, while you're pitching, you can be working on the, the manuscript. So yeah, I think that was a really good decision. Okay, thank you. I was curious about that because it, it just it just dawned on me that the agents being a gatekeeper and the publishers being gatekeepers, uh, you really have to think about the whole strategy behind it, which of course makes a great case for self-publishing because then you have total control. You know what's going to be published. You know it's going to be published faster. Uh, and you have control over all this, all the factors there, if that's the way you right. want to go. Um, so when you were writing your book, let's go back to the do's and don'ts of, of book writing. What, uh, what did you learn about writing your book that you wish you knew now? Or, or before, <laughs> you wish you knew when you started the book? I'm sorry. When I started. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, you know this, and this is, a, I love this question too, Dan. Um, I think that when you sit down to write your very first book, it feels like the biggest undertaking in the world. You know, 60,000 words, you know, is a probably a typical size manuscript. And that just sounds monumental. But if you break that down, it, you know, a, a thousand words is about three to four type pages. So if you sat down every day and you wrote four pages, you'd have a full manuscript in 60 days. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that when I started, I, I learned from the process that, wait, it sounded like it was going to be a huge ordeal. But when I, when I really carved out the time and had the discipline, I got it done really quickly. Uh, so that's something I would encourage for people who are a little intimidated by the thought of writing a book. Uh, you really don't have to, to look at it as, this giant mountain. Just take it one piece at a time. Keep your head down. You will get it done. Exactly. I tell my clients the same thing. They always have excuses. It seems that they're, they're very creative people when it comes to excuses. It's like, <laughs> I, I don't have time because I have to, you know, take the kids to the school or I have a full-time job and pick them up afterwards and blah, 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 blah. And say, like, well, can you get up 15 minutes earlier? Can you take 15 minutes from your lunch hour? Can you take 15 minutes at their soccer practice and start writing a book? Because if you can take 15 minutes to a day, you'll have your book done in three months. Uh, I'm a believer in the 20,000 word book as a big business card. So if that was your, your goal, you really could get it done in 15 minutes a day. And if you are inspired, that'll keep you, kickstart you to, to go further and, and work longer if, if you if you need to at that point, if you have the energy, which is cool. Uh, I love that. And I'll, let me just add that sure. for, um, when I, my son was young and I was, I was married and I had this insanely busy life, I would go check in to the Hampton Inn two miles from my house for a weekend. And I could get a book done in about five weekends doing that. So for people who maybe feel like their lives aren't conducive to writing at all, go check into a hotel. You know, they got to know me at the Hampton Inn. <laughs> it was like 69 bucks a night. I would literally like order a burrito and fill the fridge with bottled water and I would write for nine hours and I loved it. It was so much fun. You know, it's surprising how many people who I've interviewed on my podcast who've told the exact same story. Go to a hotel and, you know, <laughs> lock the door, turn off the TV and they get their books done. It's uh, yep. It seems to be a common thing. I'm surprised hotels don't have an author's rate because of that. 
Well, I'm telling you, Dan, I've been trying to get a hotel to sponsor the Nonfiction Authors Association for years because <laughs> that is exactly what they should be doing. And in fact, when I walked into the Hampton Inn, they had a lap desk on the bed and I thought, oh my gosh, this is home. They're <laughs> catering to a writer. I love a lap desk. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Um, everyone gets writer's block. How do you overcome writer's block? Oh, yeah. So for me, it's about shifting gears. You know, if I'm getting stuck or my brain is a little fried, I will get up and take a walk. I, in fact, this happened to me yesterday. I was really struggling kind of reworking some copy. And so I got up and I realized I hadn't had anything to eat for like four hours. <laughs> so I made a protein shake. Um, I took a 15 minute walk around the block. And when I sat back down, it was like I was ready to rock. So I think a lot of times it's just a matter of step away, shift gears for a minute and come back to it. That's great advice. When I work with my clients, the first thing we do, well, we, we've worked on the executive summary so we, they know exactly what the book is about. And then we work on their avatar so they know exactly who they're writing for. And then we do a deep dive into their outline. So chapter by chapter, sub point by sub point. And when we're done with that process, they know exactly what to do. There's a roadmap that they can follow. And if they have a lot of energy one day, they can tackle something difficult. And if they have low energy one day, they can tackle something easy. And I found that that helps a lot of my clients get over the process. You know, you mentioned something just a moment ago about getting your thoughts in order. I'm wondering, did you work with a developmental editor as part of your process or was, did you have enough confidence in yourself that first draft is good enough and I'm ready to run? Yeah. Um, I am very fortunate that I'm writing comes easily for me. It flows. I, I, I write very fast and I'm pretty logical. So like you, I start, I always start with an outline. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I jump around and and uh, it, like based on the energy level and what my interest is for that day. But I did not use a developmental editor uh, because I, I, I am fairly confident in the content itself, mm -hmm. but I absolutely work with copy editors and proofreaders. In fact, the nonfiction book, book publishing plan went through four rounds of editing. Wow. And, you know, I am such a believer in higher professionals. None of us are, can read our own work and, and catch every single error. And so you've got to hire professionals who look for, for misplaced commas and, and repeats of something that you've already mentioned and, and things like that. So I, I am a big believer in a lot of editing. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I ghost wrote a book for a client and I read the book, found some typos, used pro writing aid, used Grammarly, found more typos, cleaned it up. My wife proofread it. She cleaned it up. My client read it. His wife read it. We thought we were good to go. Uh, we actually sent it to one proofreader and she found more er errors and that was yep. fine. And then we thought, okay, now we've got them all. We had six <laughs> people read this. We're good. Well, we hired a person to do the audio version of the book and she read through it herself and sent me a note back and said, I found these 12 typos. You might want to work. <laughs> I was like, ah. okay. Yeah, and that's the thing. You think you've caught it all. And even the best editors in the world are going to miss things. They're human. So the more eyeballs on a, on a manuscript, the better. Great. What rules do you have when you engage a proofreader or a copy editor? Because it seems that if I send... A manuscript to one copy editor, they're going to put a comma in for an Oxford comma. And if I send yeah. that same updated version to another proofreader, they're going to take that comma out. And someone is going to yeah. spell out 24 and someone else is going to use the Arabic numbers. How do you keep your copy editors from overwriting each other? Well, I, I ask if they follow the Chicago manual style. Mm -hmm. That to me is very important. That uh, does require an Oxford comma. I love an Oxford comma. So all of our books are, are include Oxford commas. But I think that's a really important one that they're following the Chicago manual style. And that, that eliminates a lot of those, those issues. Mm -hmm. Great. As we're wrapping up here, what, what other words of advice do you have for business professionals who are thinking about writing uh, their book but just can't get started? Oh, my gosh. The motivation to write your book should be much higher because it 
truly can be a career game changer. You know, you said, Dan, use your book as a business card. I've worked with authors, financial advisors who they don't care how many copies they sell. They just want to hand it to a prospect. And that, that one book that maybe cost you 10, 10 to 20 grand to have written and, and edited and produced can bring you, you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars in business. So it is absolutely a game changer. A book will get you booked to speak. It will get you invited to consult. It will change your life if you do it the right way. And I love it when authors work with a professional coach like you because you help guide them and avoid a lot of the mistakes that new authors make. So I'm such an advocate. It really will change your life. Make the time. You will not regret it. Great. Great. Thank you. Why don't you tell us about a few of the other resources you offer for would-be authors at the nonfiction, uh, I'm, I'm going to blow the name of your, of your group, so the Nonfiction <laughs> Authors Association. <laughs> Let's make that sure we have the right author. title here, and I'll put it in the show notes as well with the URL. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Nonfiction Authors Association. Dot com. I'm so proud of our community, lots of educational resources and community support through our Facebook group and our local chapters. Our annual conferences are held twice a year. Our next one is this fall, November 7th and 8th. Um, we've had amazing keynote speakers. We've had Seth Godin and Guy Kawasaki and Gretchen Rubin and Julia Cameron. So uh, we bring great content. It's all delivered by the way our conferences are held by webinar. So you don't have to travel and you get amazing content. So uh, please check us out. Reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm very accessible on Facebook as well. And uh, this was really fun, Dan. Thank you so much for inviting me. My pleasure. Why don't you uh, also share the URL for your association as well? And that will be in the show notes too. Super. Thank you. Nonfictionauthorsassociation.com and a nonfictionwritersconference.com. Uh, if you're interested in the hybrid publishing piece, that's authoritypublishing.com. Great. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for listening to Top Business Leaders, the only podcast that shows you exactly how people just like you have built their businesses by writing a book. If you'd like to write your book but don't know where to start, you can find great information at writeyourbookinaflash.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another insightful interview to help you become a top business leader.